folks have used the notebooks and love them? How many aren't quite sold on the notebooks benefits or usage? <laughs> and how many have never used the notebooks and don't know? OK, so a few. OK, cool. Well, for those of you that haven't used it at all, I'm going to go kind of fast, but I think you guys will all keep up. Um, and I hope to answer the question for those of you that don't quite get where the notebook fits in to your workflow. Um, hopefully, I will give you some ideas of what might be useful to you. OK, so um, this is really a talk for beginners, but it has a lot of content that's new with Jupyter Lab as well as Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Lab is going to be the next generation of the notebook. So different user interface, a little more composable, more IDE-like, but still has some of the simplicity that the original classic notebook has. Jupyter Hub is a hosted version of the notebooks, which you can use in large classrooms like at Berkeley or Cal Poly, where I'm at. We teach students so that they don't have to download stuff to their own computers or have the latest and greatest computer. They're just running through a web browser. OK. So I'm Carol Willing. Probably the only useful thing to know about me is I'm passionate about education and helping people reach their potential through using software and software tools. And one of my um, things that drew me to Jupyter, as well as Python, was how much you could get done in a little bit of code, because we have such rich libraries, and how readable those codes are. OK, so the notebook itself um, sort of started in the scientific community, as Travis had said. And Fernando Perez and Brian Granger got together uh, with Min, Wright, and Kelly and came up with this interactive replacement or uh, user interface for the REPL, the IPython REPL. And the notebook lets you have code, prose, visualizations, and um, a way to communicate ideas. So if you're working on a scientific research project, you might have something that you run one day, something that you run another day. How do you keep track of it? The old school was lab notebooks, hard copies. Some of them are still around. And now you're seeing more electronic ones. But one of the benefits of um, the notebooks in science is the ability to reproduce your research and have other people reproduce your research and be able to share and collaborate with those notebooks. So, before I get to Jupyter Lab, um, I want to talk a little bit about the classic notebook. And as I said, it has the combination of code, prose, uh, images, visualizations. You can link in YouTube videos, um, which really makes it a powerful teaching tool, as well as a powerful prototyping tool and a tool for doing data science, which I'm sure quite a few of you in here are doing. But also people in, let's say, Japan at a university, they've used it to um, communicate their operations workflows to their different sysadmins. Um, if there's a site crisis, they have sort of their uh, steps of how they recover and what they do in notebooks. So it's not solely data science. And if you think of it as more an interactive book or an interactive document where you can communicate different things, you can execute code, and provide guidance to somebody and share it. That's about right. And um, over 50-something languages, now I think it's over 100 languages. So for those of you that are new to the notebook, it is a fairly simple user interface in the classic notebook. Um, very linear. There's cells as you go down. You put code or prose or in those cells, and then hit Shift Enter, and something magically will happen. Hopefully not a traceback. Hopefully like a lovely visualization or something meaningful. Um, so Project Jupiter, where are we today? There are millions of users. There's over, I think I heard 2.6 million notebooks now on GitHub, and um, we were 
honored as sort of the de facto standard by the ACM and won the Software Systems Award, which other folks like Unix and the web browser and um, cool stuff like that has won. But you can see it's a variety of people that actually use the notebook. And I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, we talked about reproducible science. Um, for those of you that are interested in space or black holes, LIGO, there was, when there was a big you know, uh, information about it, there's actually a LIGO tutorial that you can just click a button on Binder, which is a service that essentially lets you take a GitHub URL and put it in a field hit launch, and it will launch an ephemeral container out there on the web with all your dependencies and give you the notebook interface and, or the Jupyter Lab interface and let you work on it there. You can download stuff, and then when your session ends, everything goes away. Um, notebooks allow open journalism. Uh, when I was in the Philippines, I saw people in a uh, news organization communicating between their support people and their sales people and their product people through notebooks. And what they were finding was they were able to get more information that was useful to different teams and cross-pollinate faster than traditional code-based um, and memo-based communication. Um, Folks like O'Reilly has done, used it to author interactive books. Um, for those of you that are interested in economics, there's a project called Quant Econ that has phenomenal um, resources on Python as well as Julia on how, you know, essentially a graduate level class um, in economics. Um, really well done. So if we look at the notebook and Jupyter Lab in particular, we have some different building blocks for interactive computing. We have file browsers, we have code, we have um, consoles, and then the notebook interactive interface as well. And many people need to use all of them in their workflow. And with uh, Jupyter Lab, we give the ability to have multiple windows that open at once. Um, have more of a traditional file browser, launcher, and um, something that you're more familiar with, like if you're using Atom or VS Code or Vim, pick your favorite editor, and as well as getting the benefits of the notebook. And we'll go a little deeper into Jupyter Lab if it goes forward. OK. So Jupyter Lab. It's extensible by design. It uses modern JavaScript for the front end. Um, and there's a lot of separation between functionality and how things are displayed. And because of the way it is architected, it is very straightforward for third parties to extend what you see within Jupyter Lab. Just like in VS Code, you have different plugins that you can you know, have functionality for like a linter or something else. You will see over time different things. You might see biology-oriented plugins. You might see uh, machine learning plugins and really um, tables of contents, things like that. Um, Jupyter Lab today um, can be found on GitHub, and it is an open source project. Um, about 100 contributors, almost three years of work, and um, a lot of releases, primarily because its components are released in different stages and you know, between the JavaScript and the Python. Um, and really, it says it's currently in beta, but it's practically for users. It's a 1.0 uh, deployment at this point. It's very stable. For those of you that are developing those third-party applications, the APIs are pretty stable. Um, I don't work directly on Jupyter Lab, so I can't say that they're not going to change at all. But I think they're getting to the point where the change should be minimal. Uh, you can use it today through using Conda or PIP or PIPENV. And <clears throat> 
and eventually the classic notebook will be retired. But if you're using the classic notebook now and you haven't tried Jupyter Lab, don't worry. It's not going to go away really fast. It'll be several years and sort of like, you know, as one trails off, the other will pick up. Um, I'm going to do a whirlwind tour of Jupyter Lab, and I was going to do it live, but I'm not going to do it live because of the length of time that we have. And I want to make sure I get more of the content out and then let you try it on your own and explore it a little deeper. So here you can see the launcher, which is a more visual launcher. You can launch different languages, different kernels, whether you want a console, whether you want just a strict text editor to do markdown. Um, you can see that it's a similar user interface to the existing notebook. Um, one of the nice things that people have asked about with the classic notebook was the ability to collapse cells. And you can now do that. You can collapse input, output, and you can drag and drop, which makes it a lot easier. And in fact, you can drag and drop between cells between notebooks. So if you have multiple notebooks open, which is really a nice feature for those of you that are using it to either teach or in production for machine learning stuff. Um, one of the other things that um, with the notebooks people find is, OK, you're making this nice notebook, but I want to do like some scratch calculations, but I don't want to mess up my nice pretty notebook. You can do a couple things. One is you could create a copy of the notebook and work in the copy. But the other thing you can do is you can create a console uh, by shift clicking and, and pulling, you know, just clicking like create console for this notebook. And then that will give you an, an immutable initial uh, content, but then it will let you r run things and do scratch work without it populating back to the notebook, original notebook, until you want it to. Um, and this one's one of those that's a little easier to see in action. Um, editors, there's different editors available, Vim, Sublime, I think Emacs. Um, so for those of you that want a dark palette, light palette, there's lots of ways to customize your Jupyter Lab environment. Um, again, connecting to the console, this is an example of a markdown file that you might find as you're writing documentation. And in that markdown file, there are actually some code blocks. Um, and in that code block, um, let's say we were in Python, we might be able to run like the small little code block. Well, here we can render the markdown and see it side by side. But then we can also hover over the code block. I don't know if this is working. but so this code block here, you can hover over it, shift enter, shift click on it, and it will actually display the output of the code that's in the document, which um, is very nice when you're uh, writing books, writing papers, things like that. Uh, for those people like myself who really love the classic notebook and how clean and approachable it was, one of the things that drew me to the IPython notebook years ago is I was teaching students in a fab lab in San Diego how to make like open hardware and code things. And the notebook was the first thing that I had seen really touch a wide group of kids. And by that, I mean not just the kids that are interested in code, but the kids that had been told, eh, you're not good at math and science, you can't code wrong, um, but they felt like, OK, I can make music with this. And that was one of the first libraries I played with was a Music 21 library. And since music is universal, I was able to have them create music, play music, render sheet music, convert it to Braille, all in a lot of times in five lines of code or less. So all of a sudden, they have this new empowering experience, and then with the rich Python ecosystem, I was like, OK, pick your favorite topic. And let's go find a library. And you work. And you be in control. And I think the single notebook, single user mode, was nice for those people that were a little scared or tentative at first. 
but then once they got started, they're like, this is, e this, I, this is something I can do. If I had known I could code, I would have done it ages ago. So I think it's very empowering. Um, now, when we talked about it being extensible last year at SciPy, I am not a biology person at all, but um, some of the folks that were there created something called a FASTA viewer, where you were able to, I think it's genetic sequencing, correct me if I'm wrong, and they were able to code it up in a few lines of code one evening and make it into a notebook extension, which you could then render and execute within a notebook. So that ability to prototype and then change that prototype into something that is useful and will persist, um, I think is pretty cool. Um, also, um, data sets, grids, scale. Those of you that are working with large data sets, production data sets, uh, genomic data, you will probably have more data than can fit into an Excel spreadsheet. And you can load that data into Jupyter Lab, scroll it, and it moves really cleanly, really nicely. Um, and it's something that, with the classic notebook, we just couldn't get that processing performance out of it. But now we can with the more modern JavaScript. So I said I was going to do a live demo. I kind of lied a little bit, because I want to tell you, we might still have time, but I want to tell you a little bit more about um, how this interacts with Jupyter Hub and some of the hosted tools. <clears throat> okay, so just to recap, drag and drop functionality, ability to hide cells, um, run code blocks interactively, whether it's Python, LaTeX, R, Julia. Uh, the link to a code console um, and interactively have more than one thing talking to a language kernel is really powerful. And it's something that we just fundamentally can't do um, with any ease with the classic notebook. So if that seems appealing to you, that's a good reason to start using JupyterLab. And then many, many different file formats, a lot of different visualization formats look beautiful when um, rendered within JupyterLab. Um, the slide deck I will put online um, and through both the uh, conference, as well as I always have all of my talks on speaker deck, and um, these links will be live. Um, some great places um, if you're into science or into notebooks in general, um, SciPy, PyData conferences, all of those talks are on YouTube, so very accessible. The tutorials are excellent. They walk you through really from complete beginner to, OK, I'm proficient in both beginning topics as well as advanced topics. Uh, Jason Grout and some of the rest of the Jupyter Lab team did a great talk at SciPy about Jupyter Lab, the next generation, that went much more in depth than I just did now. And um, you know, try.jupyter.org should be your friend. That lets you just click on a link, launch a binder container, and, and have your own Jupyter Lab there without installing anything on your own computer. Uh, Jupyter Hub is what we like to say is computational thinking for groups. And Jupyter Hub has been around a while. And you can think of it as like these XKCD folks, each of them get their own Jupyter server and interface without having to install anything locally other than having a web browser. Um, we recognize that when you're deploying a production service, whether it's on bare metal or to the cloud, it can be complicated. And so what we did last year is we sort of wrote up a zero to Jupyter Hub guide using Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is still kind of a moving target in many ways, but um, we kind of took several different popular cloud providers gave you, OK, how do you get to even a Kubernetes cluster on those services? And then from there, how do you install Jupyter Hub? And how do you configure it to meet your particular needs? So I highly recommend that um, if you want to try out Jupyter Hub. Um, 
we call it the Zero to Jupiter Hub Guide. We are also working on another deployment of Jupiter Hub right now. It's called the Littlest Jupiter Hub. I don't know if that name will change, but basically for smaller groups of folks, like maybe five to 50 people, whereas uh, Jupiter Hub we've seen scale to thousands and thousands of people. Um, very popular machine learning. Uh, you provide all the tools that, and libraries that you want your data scientists to use, and they've got it all there at their fingertips when they log in to their own particular user session. Um, there is also another project called Kubeflow. So those of you that might be familiar with the TensorFlow world, um, Kubeflow uses Jupyter Hub underneath uses the notebooks as part of the user interface as well as the TensorFlow dashboard and um, is supposed to be a standard way to deploy different machine learning uh, environments. We'll see how that goes um, because there is still sort of that split between TensorFlow and everything else. So like Travis said, uh, Binder is really exciting for us for a number of reasons. One is we can share things with students much more easily. We can share things with peers more easily. We can share tutorials. Um, uh, reproducible science and publishing and papers. We are looking at taking Binder and making it so that within a scientific paper, there'll be a little badge or a link that says, click launch on Binder. And so you've, you might see an image in a paper and it'll have the URL that you just click and it'll load up the data sets and everything you need to run something. Um, Featured in Nature and some other um, publications as well. Um, for those of you that are interested in addition to Jupyter Hub, you can also create your own binder hub. And again, we've got very straightforward instructions on how to do that. Um, this is the Jupyter team. Um, we're not a huge team, so we really do rely on all of the community to help us move forward with these tools. These tools would not exist if it weren't for the greater community. And um, when we started Jupiter Hub, it was Min, Reagan, Kelly, and myself. That's it. And it wasn't until last year when we added a few more people and um, also got a grant to do Binder. So we really do rely on people. Um, and also, the community brings us different resources that we don't have in our own team, and that is hugely valuable. So I encourage you to get involved. Uh, Jupyter prides itself on having friendly Gitter channels. Um, this coming week may be a little less friendly than most because many of us will be at JupyterCon and probably a little stressed about talks, but um, somebody will eventually get back to you. Um, unlike some projects, we're okay if you ask some support questions within issues as well. Um, we, we recommend that you try the Gitter channel first or the mailing list because more eyes will probably see it and then, um, you know, go forth. So I want to thank you for being here. I think we have a little time for questions. Yeah, we've got about five minutes. Okay, cool. And um, while you... Ask questions. I'm going to see if I can get Jupiter Lab up. This is like what's running behind the scenes of Binder. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Good. So, um, can you mix different languages in a Jupiter notebook? And also, could you explain how you got the name Jupiter? Okay. So, I'm going to take the second part of the question first. Um, the Jupiter name came at SciPy in 2014. Um, because we came out of the scientific community, Python, R, and Julia are the three big languages that are typically used, and it was a combination of those three languages. But there's many other languages that Jupyter supports. Um, you can have multiple um, languages in a notebook. Uh, there is, like, Min has a project called Multikernel, and so you can do it. Um, I would say you probably want a pretty compelling reason to do it before doing it. You know, it wouldn't be the norm, but um, it is possible. Cool. Oh, and I said I was going to find Jupyter Lab while you find questions. Hi. 
Hi, hi, Carol. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, quick question: as sure. I was, as as I was hearing everything, kind of just like a revelation just came. Um, is this is Drupal Lab kind of like a is it a competitor for like our studio and trying to get grab that like share the market of like those type of users that are comfortable with like IDs? I, I don't know if I would use the word competitor. I would use maybe it, it complements it well. Obviously, there are some things you can do with R and R Studio that is really cool. Um, as most of us have science backgrounds, we're not, as much as I love Python and my heart is with Python and with the Python community, I use other languages and other tools. And you just use the tool that works best for the case. Um, our studio is supported within Binder and Jupyter Hub, so you can have both. I mean, you have to have the license for our studio if it's the license version, but um, I think Jupyter Lab was in response to the users that we had. And, you know, you're going to have one size is not going to fit all. So, like the little black dress that you're going from informal to very formal, you know. I might want to use a very simple notebook if I'm working with sixth grade students. But if I'm in a data scientist who knows my tools, knows what's going on, knows what I want to do, Jupyter Lab may be a much better approach or something that can supplement the other tools that um, scientists use and data scientists. Good question. Yeah. So I've been using Jupyter Notebooks for a while, and they are great. Uh, I had one comment that does the notebook support interactive commands for shell? So if I do like pip install or pip uninstall something, and it asks me a prompt, do I need to uninstall yes, no? I'm, Can I give the user input back? As, as far as I know, yes, because I've done it, but. I think um, you can do it with Python. I wasn't sure with shell. You know, if you do the percent percent bash, you should be Travis. You might know, but I th I think you can. And you know, there with the composable components, things are changing very quickly as well. But I am I know that I've pip installed stuff, so I'm assuming I said yes at some point. But honestly, off the top of my head, I don't know. So try it. So if we use uh, Jupyter Notebooks for like generating reports, is there a dynamic way to like modify them? So yes. We could um, produce multiple. Yes. Actually, um, I was talking to somebody earlier. Um, because we are a community-driven project, there are other uh, community members, in this case, Interact, um, N-T-E-R-A-C-T. They are. Um, uh, Netflix is a big funder. It's one of the, it's, it's open source, but there's a project called Paper Mill that lets you run parameterized notebooks and lets you kind of take a workflow and change the parameters and spit it out on the other side. And that will continue to evolve. And I believe at Cal Poly this summer, we have a bunch of summer interns, and I believe that a Jupyter Lab. Um, Plugin similar to that is in the works as well. Yeah. Oh, hey, thanks, Carol. You're welcome. Um, for the uh, former like collaborative editing um, feature, right. there was a plugin to Jupyter Lab. On the GitHub pull request, um, they were talking about looking at the Atom Telegraph um, implementation right. of, for collaborative editing, and they used to have that for a while while Google s supported it. Right. Um, but is anybody Looking at the like telegraph or for the collaborative, so that you could teach somebody online, like you. Right. So real time editing, collaborative editing. Um, Ian Rose is the person that is predominantly working on it. He would be the best person to give you the most up to date information. It is a key priority. Um, it was unfortunate that that API that he had built the Google plugin went away, and so we had to. Take that plug in and deprecate it. But um, yeah. I think we're out of time. We're out uh, of time? Yes, but I'm sure Carol's happy to take questions. I am happy to take questions so in the hallway track. Just... I will be here probably for another three hours, and then I jump on a plane to go home and then to New York. So, but thank you all. I hope you'll try Jupiter. Remember, try.jupiter.org.